And what I tell people is that uh, you need to prioritize what's important for you in life. Um, and one piece of advice I give people, and it, I think it's especially important to protect people, finances and learning how to manage finances is probably the single best thing you can do for yourself to improve your mental health uh, and to make life significantly, not only less miserable, but happier. People who will save more American lives than anyone else are not doctors. They're the software engineers and data scientists that figure out an algorithm that can improve safety by 10% on the road. They will save more American lives than any doctor ever has in the US. And that just goes to show you just how dangerous the roads really are. Welcome to the Richmond Alake podcast. This week, we are speaking with Shashank Kalanivi. Shashank has worked as a data analyst, data scientist, and is now a senior data engineer. Apart from the breadth of experience within the data field, Shashank also holds a very strong awareness for finance topic. In our conversation, we step outside of the technical aspect of the AI field and talk about salaries, negotiation tactics, student debts, and generally financial consideration that data practitioners should be making. So, I'm Richmond Alake, and one person at a time, I'm exploring the stories of the humans behind AI and data. And I hope you enjoy this conversation and come away a better practitioner. Thank you for listening. And I usually don't say this, but I should. If you enjoyed this episode, please do like and subscribe on YouTube or share and rate on your favorite podcast channel. Hi, Shashank. Thanks for joining me on my podcast and having a conversation with me today. And I'm just going to go straight in and jump into the deep end. And But you need no introduction. You have a massive following on YouTube. You're, you're the YouTube data analyst and um, you've, you've got a lot of videos and courses on Excel and other um, analytics tools, and your stuff is very interesting. So let, let's dive into it. I'm going to start with a simple question. What does a data analyst do? I know it's going to sound ridiculous, but um, I'm more on the computer vision side, machine learning side of this whole AI thing. Uh, but what does a data analyst actually do? Uh, well, thank you so much for having me on, Richmond. Great question. I, uh, you'll see that I, I will have a lot of ca caveats with any question that I, that I answer. The caveat I provide over here is that the definition I'm going to give is that of like a corporate data analyst, someone that works in a corporation, because the, what we do is for example, very different from like what our compatriots in academia do. It'll be related, but different. So I would say a data analyst in corporate America is usually concerned with taking the requirements of a user. So uh, what, what do requirements mean, right? Requirements refer to what does a user actually want to do and how do we break that down into actual things that can be done using computers? So for example, a director comes and says, hey, I need to know how many units were sold out of store, why over the last year and how that compares to the previous year. And if there's a statistical significance in the difference between these two years, or it's just basically the same thing. And you break that into a bunch of different things. What, are the, what does the person want to know? Well, first of all, they want to know how um, metric A has changed from last year to this year. Okay. I always like to ask myself, why would they want to know that, right? And in this case, obviously, it's a, probably a pretty obvious thing, but usually it's because they need to report out some metric for the future. Um, or they have a hypothesis that they're working on. And that's what you have to start asking people. You have to start asking them and broaching the question. Okay. Like why specifically do you want to know this? What is the hypothesis you're trying to test? Because oftentimes people will be looking at the wrong data in order to try and uh, test out a hypothesis. So they, um, give me some requirements. I go and I check and I make sure that the data we have actually can answer those questions. And then I'll write usually a bunch of SQL queries in order to pull that data. And then if I have to run stats on it, then we uh, pull that data into Python and start running some stats to make sure that we provide the user with what they're asking for. And I can either export that typically into a BI tool, a BI standing for business intelligence. Um, that would be like Tableau, Power BI, uh, Google Data Studio or into an Excel spreadsheet if it's more of an ad hoc request and we're not gonna build an entire dashboard over it. So um, get the requirements from the user, uh, translate them into things that can actually be done, check if the data actually exists to do those things, pull the data, model it if we need to, then uh, present it to them in the, in the required format. I recommend that uh, anyone that is interested in this look up the CRISP DM, um, uh, I don't know what you call it, like cycle, I guess, uh, stands for cross-industry standard process for data mining. And it's something that IBM developed in like the 80s or 90s. 
which more or less, it, it depicts the basic process that any, any data science project goes through. So. You've given a very good description about what a data analyst does, but I see there's some a bit of crossover with what a data scientist might do as well. So is, it sounds like there's a blurred lineup. The only thing you did mention was to make your data fit a machine learning model. And But what, can you speak to the difference between a data analyst and a data scientist? Uh, that is a good question. Uh, the tongue-in-cheek answer is uh, uh, pay, uh, but... <laughs> but the um, more accurate answer would probably be something along the lines of, I would say uh, a, a great example is what we do at Nordstrom. So for anyone not aware, I work in Nordstrom, which is a major North American fashion retailer. Um, you go to the malls, we sell high-end clothes uh, out of our stores. Um, and one big difference is, so a data analyst will do something along the lines of like, okay, we want to know same store, same store sales in the last three years. We go pull that data. We might do a little bit of like very basic statistical modeling in order to make sure that the data actually is what we're expecting it to be. A data science would solve a question along the lines of like, okay, what is the traffic in your stores at any given time? We, we don't know the number of people who are in our stores um, at all times. Um, and so what a data scientist will do is use a bunch of data to create a model of some kind, typically a machine learning model of some kind, um, or a, sometimes a, a statistical model in order to determine, okay, given that you have this many people in these stores, uh, and we know that for sure, we expect there are this many people in these stores, given these, uh, what we call... Um, Given these features, I, was, I, I, was, I kept thinking functions for some reason, no features, yeah, given these features, um, which are basically just columns of data, right? So uh, given these features, we expect that there are this many people in that store. And I'd say that's kind of the big difference between the data analyst and the data scientist. Data analysts usually work with data that already exists, whereas data scientists will oftentimes fill in gaps where data doesn't exist and try and make inferences and assumptions um, using models to fill in where data doesn't actually exist. But a data analyst very much works with like the data that is available. Okay. Is in would you say like a data to become a data scientist, you can easily transition from a data analyst to a data scientist. So is it like some is a data analyst or sort, uh, sort of like a bridging role into being a data scientist? I think it depends on who you ask, right? Like I know people that are um, that have been in the data analyst position for decades and they seem to you know really enjoy being over there. I think it very much can be, but I, I would also warn people that. If you don't put in the extra effort to really show higher up leadership that you can do these more advanced data science skills, because at the end of the day, they have to pay you more for that. You can't take, you can't be promoted into a data scientist and not get paid more. Um, if you are, uh, I would have a talk with your manager that shouldn't be happening, but uh, because of the higher pay that data scientists demand, companies are you know very wary of promoting people into that. So I think that it is a bridging role, but it's you have to be careful not to get stuck in the data analyst work. So you need to be doing the data analyst work and then actively trying to expand on that work with your, you know, at your time in the company. And that's probably the only way you'll get into the data science position. It doesn't naturally bridge is probably what I would say. Um, like the bridge is like three quarters of the way built and you need to be able to jump that last quarter. Do you know what? One thing, let's talk about that last quarter. Cause one thing I've heard you mention is the extra work you put in very earlier on in your career to get your first promotion. And I think you mentioned that you're working 60 hours a week. Um, what does that look like? As in what advice and tips can you give to someone that's looking to, to sort of go through that sort of bridge and that last quarter? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. The 60 hours a week, um, you know, it's debatable whether I recommend that to people. Um, I, you know, like I have my criticisms of, for example, the consulting industry or like the finance industry, uh, which are industries that are known to pay people um, well, in, in consulting, pay people not the most amazing salaries, but uh, like as soon as they graduate out of college into like these big cohorts. And then basically work them to the bone for two years and then have them leave with, you know, the stamp of approval from um, uh, consulting company A, B or C or D. You know, there's like one of four, basically, that people really care about. I, I'm not sure I would highly recommend the 60 hour work week. I will say that you need to make it a point to do the extra work. So a great example of this would be, OK, so you, you do the analysis that the people ask for. And then you go ahead and just try playing around with the machine learning model in relation to that data and provide them with something extra and just keep doing that over and over again. And eventually people will real and, and, and make it clear with your manager, say, look, I want to get promoted into this role. I've done this extra work with you. I obviously have the skills and I know our company data better than any data scientists you could hire from the outside. I would say that's probably what the last quarter is really about. It's about taking your analyses to that next level. And the, the reason I think it is difficult to do is because data analysts can make very comfortable salaries, but there is a glass ceiling, I believe, 
uh, when you become a data analyst, if you don't decide to go into management, like as a, as an IC, an individual contributor, um, which is basically the word for like people who are like actually like you know like writing code and stuff like that, um, and don't manage people. I would I would say, given that you can make a very comfortable salary as a data analyst, I'm talking properly into the six figures um, in the U.S. at least. It is easy to get complacent, you know. And then as you become an adult, as you become older, you know, you like go out with friends, hang out with uh, people on the weekends. Uh, start building out your your social life. Um, and, you know, depending on your group of friends, people may not start talking about incomes versus school. We're like, you know, you have a general idea of like how well people are performing at school. Um, so there might be this like inherent pressure to do better and better and better. That doesn't necessarily exist when you're an adult, depending on the friend group you hang out with, right? Um, so I would say that extra effort is quite difficult, mostly because it's very comfortable being a data analyst. Um, and so you really have to work harder to become that data scientist. But I say the rewards outside of like the intellectual stimulation are the fact that there is effectively no cap to the, the salary of a data scientist. That title can charge all kinds of salaries depending on where you work. But a data analyst can really only charge so much money. Okay. So as in, I want to go into sort of ask you some questions that has to do with visibility and building your confidence, but I can get to that later. But one thing you mentioned is you were speaking about data analysts from a corporate America perspective. So I just want to ask for entry level folks, right? Should I go work in corporate America or should I just go work as a data analyst in a startup? I've got my preference, right? Um, I could tell you mine when you shared yours. Um, what, what is your, what's your experience and what would you recommend based on your experience? So this is an interesting question that I get a lot from people on my uh, live streams. And what I tell people is that uh, you need to prioritize what's important for you in life. Um, and one piece of advice I give people, and it, I think it's especially important for tech people, finances and learning how to manage finances is probably the single best thing you can do for yourself to improve your mental health uh, and to make life significantly, not only less miserable, but happier. Um, and, and that's not me saying money is everything. What I'm saying is the inability to manage money, the inability to make a um, certain salary and work within a budget at that salary uh, causes a lot of pain in people's lives. The number one reason for divorce in America is uh, financial strain. I, I would say wages have stagnated for a, a large cohort of Americans, not, not the group we're talking about, like data analysts and stuff like that. And the reason I bring all that up, right? is to say my reasoning for why I believe people should get into corporate America and build up the resume base and the financial base at an early age in order to allow themselves to safely make uh, riskier decisions in the future. Now, when you say startup, um, startups can mean any number of things, right? Like you can get a startup that's so well-funded, they have $100 million in free-floating capital just available to them, uh, in which case I'd say, what's the risk in that? So, um, you know, like st startup, like there's a lot of different like types of startups, but I recommend people get into uh, corporate America, build out a solid financial base, uh, build up a decent investment portfolio, and from there, kind of scope out what you really want to do and uh, go from there. And, you know, a lot of people find themselves very happy in corporate America. Yeah, it's, I think I have a different opinion to a different perspective to you. It's sort of like reverse. So I would say start out in a startup and then work your way into sort of corporate and that sort of comfortable comfortable lifestyle but you do raise a very good point which is the financial benefits and that you want to sort of get at the start of your career i'm of the mind that you should put yourself in stressful scenarios very earlier on within your career that you would get in a startup in a startup you might be a data analyst in a startup but i feel like that's the very that's a very good chance for you to explore different roles like a data scientist or machine learning engineer, or just to transition, it will be easier for you to cross that bridge within a startup as it would in corporate America. Because in corporate sure. America, they've, they've probably got thousands of, of, of people to fill that data scientist and machine learning role. Now you have to prove yourself and go again. So that's that's my opinion. And But yours does make a lot of sense if you're thinking about having that financial stability and security as well, especially in this day and age. Um, yeah, I'm doing mine the opposite way. Yeah, no, and that makes a perfect sense. I, I would say even with my methodology, like I think I took mine and went a bit like too far with it. When I say the financial security, first of all, one, one major thing is, did you pay off your student loan debt, right? Depending on what type of student loan debt you graduated with. Uh, if you graduated with government debt, it may not be that bad. If you graduated with private loan debt, in my opinion, if you graduate with private loan debt, where in the US, like those interest rates can be like 12, 15%. Uh, percent, 
your only choice is to make a ton of money. Um, and at that point, you know, greed is good. You got to watch out for yourself over there. So, and that's what I mean by like, you know, everyone needs to like look at their own situation and be like, okay, like what is my financial position right now? If you graduated debt-free, then I think that there are so many options available to you and that's awesome. Or say you graduated with like sub 15K debt, 4% government interest. Um, I think that's a, another uh, position you could take uh, a lot of risks. What you said is 100% accurate though. If you work at a startup, you're going to be able to get a lot more exposure to different jobs. And there is a very big benefit to that. So yeah. I tell everyone, I, I give my opinion and I think, that people should deeply think about what makes sense for them, you know? Yeah. Spencer, as in, you mentioned that you work in um, Nord Nordstrom, which is, uh, which basically um, works within the retail industry. Mm -hmm. What sort of industry are you open to as a data analyst? What sort, what sort of industry can you work within? So I personally work in retail. Yeah. I think for me, I, I would love to work in automotive one day. I'm a huge car nerd. So Working in automotive would be very interesting and, and practically something in more of engineering side of it, less so operations because uh, automotive companies are empires in the truest sense, in the sense that it, they generate huge amounts of income, but more importantly, like what is an empire? An empire is a collection of states that are ruled by an emperor or an empress. It's not a single state. And that, that's a very important distinction between an empire and a kingdom and a uh, auto manufacturer is very much an empire in the sense that there are uh, parts suppliers. Those parts suppliers, each of those companies are worth billions of dollars. Um, uh, Toyota owns part of Denso in Japan and the, just Denso is worth billions of dollars. The only, um, I believe the only non-white owner of an NFL team is the owner of an auto parts manufacturer in the United States. Um, it's like a vend and fix or something like that. I forgot what exactly what it was called. Quick question. Why do you know this information? This is... <laughs> Uh, I'm a bit, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, I do a lot of reading, I guess. It's, uh, yeah. you could say. Um, I'm a huge automotive nerd. Uh, so, so that's where I, like, I know about like the supply chains behind like automotive companies. And, and, and like I said, I remember growing up because I saw cars everywhere. I just assumed they were easy to build. But when you start researching them, you start to realize that it is actually a, it's very, very, it's a very brutal industry, very difficult to run in. The American auto manufacturers basically all had to get bailed out. Ford only didn't have to get bailed out in 08 because they happened to take a big loan right before the financial crisis, but they weren't expecting the financial crisis. You know, they were expecting, they were like, okay, we just want to be safe. Um, you know, but, and, and you see that versus like, you know, how, how, for example, like Toyota Japan is managed. It's a very different management structure and it's run very conservatively, but that also has its detriments as well. Uh, I'd say GM in some ways is a bit more of an agile company today than Toyota is. Um, but Toyota is also like just this behemoth that controls way more money than their balance sheet would lead you to believe they control or their market cap would lead you to believe they control. That's probably a better way of putting it. Um, but mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing I know is Toyota is exploring the whole sort of um, autonomous vehicle market. Um, they've got certain research arms that are looking into that space. So as a data analyst, where do you fit in the future of the automotive industry in the sense of self-driving? And that's where I think that I would actually start transitioning my skills into things like computer vision and stuff like that. Those are skills that more obviously fit into the engineering aspect of automotive and self-driving. And I think that a data analyst fits very much into the operational side of the business. Okay. You have this car manufacturer, especially auto. The, the, the big thing that car companies care about in relation to like automotive driving is that you can get rid of people. People don't have to be individual drivers anymore. You can just have cars out and about picking people up, dropping them off in various places, centralizing all that stuff. And all that data needs to be analyzed at some point in time, right? Like automotive companies might start becoming transportation companies in the future, because if autonomous driving d does live up to the hype eventually, then why not get rid of the most expensive part of the entire equation, which is the most expensive and the most prone to failure part of the entire equation, which is a human. And I think in that world, data scientists, computer vision experts and, uh, are probably going to have the most employment opportunities in those companies. Data analysts will probably be working mostly on like the operation side, which is one of the reasons I want to build up my skills and move into maybe more of that computer vision stuff. I think there's actually an Israeli company that has an open source challenge where they give you some traffic data and you're supposed to predict the speed of, that the car is going at any given time. And this is literally someone just taped a smartphone to their dashboard and recorded the drive. And using that, you need to have an algorithm that can predict the speed the car goes at. Um, highly recommend checking that out for anyone interested in the industry. Yeah. So in, should we say in five years time, Shishank will become a computer vision engineer. Five, 10 years? 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, uh, maybe. I, I'm, and what I'm hoping happens is that the uh, requirement for educations for this stuff, people start loosening those requirements. And then specifically in this field, I think it's important because, so for example, I have a chemistry degree, right? In order to practice my craft as a chemist, I have to go into a $10 million lab that is owned by a university or a major biopharmaceutical company that can actually afford to buy this lab. To practice computer vision stuff, the, just buy a computer with a decent GPU, you know, not even $2,000. Um, and, and I mean, forget that. You can even like send stuff to the cloud for free these days. But, um, like you know, yeah. exactly. Google Colab is like free. You can use the GPUs uh, to an extent for free and everything. Deep Note is another, you know, great tool you could use as well. And the $1,500 computer that you can buy allows you to cr like compete against the most advanced engineers out there in like learning skills. You can build up these insane skills because the computer is the infinite laboratory that traditional sciences, the natural sciences needed a $10 million lab in order to train people in. So that, that's why I hope specifically in this industry, we start reducing the requirements of education for people that come in if they can prove out those skills. Um, my doctor needs to be very well educated. I'm cool with that. If the computer vision engineer can prove that they know what they know, you know, why not? I feel like recently I've been doing a bunch of research into sort of the education requirements for machine learning, computer vision, NLP roles. And you'd be surprised at the percentage of individuals that have a PhD. And it is an, I'm just educated to a master's level and I thought I was good. But looking at the number of candidates, I'm a bit sort of uh, not worried, but I'm just thinking, okay, do I need to maybe get a PhD just so you can compete with the candidate pool? So yeah. it is true that it will be good to see the educational requirements come down to a reasonable level, or at least there is some consideration that is not just based on education, which I believe there is. But you did mention that you expect your doctor to be educated to a massive degree. Self-driving is a very, very sensitive technology where a mistake could possibly take someone's life. And mm -hmm. we've seen a lot of like court cases and a lot of regulation that is coming into the space. When you say that you probably need the best of the best working on these problem, as opposed to someone with a bachelor's degree that's got some very decent, good portfolio. Maybe you want someone that's got a PhD that spent a lot of years researching this. What was your opinion on that? What's your thoughts on that? That's a really important consideration over there. I guess the way I see it is there are always going to be PhDs and highly educated people involved in these teams. Safety is very much like a, a relative metric. What is considered safe? Well, if you live in the United States, safety from violence in cities, is the, the standard over here is significantly lower than if you live in Japan. The kinds of violent crime we have over here would be completely unacceptable in a country like Japan. But you know, I mean, I, I still go out. I still go out to bars. I'm out at 2 a.m. hanging out with my friends and stuff, you know, okay, staying relatively safe. But the point is, I think relative is very important. And the baseline in self-driving cars is humans. And humans are horrendous at driving. They get emotional. They get tired. They, they get mad. The concept of road rage escapes my mind. Like, I, I don't get it. Like, you have a 2,000-pound machine and you're going to, like, you just ram. Yeah, exactly. Drunk. They get drunk. So... I 100% agree that there needs to be very high standards for how automotive automobiles are like coded up and how the algorithms and those computers work, applications work. I will also say that the bar for improvement, in my opinion, is very low. People were really freaking out when um, that one person was hit by, was it a Tesla or I, I forgot which cell, Uber's, I think Uber self-driving car. And Uber took their entire network offline in, in the Phoenix area, at least immediately. It was either Phoenix or San Francisco. Um, which, you know, I mean, again, very good for them. And I'm, I'm glad that people take it seriously. But again, I think people, we sometimes lose sight of the fact that at the end of the day, the baseline is the human driver who is horrible at driving. And so I, you know, I, I see what you're saying. Uh, I, I also just feel like the baseline for safety is so low, um, considering the human factor. Anything is probably an improvement. People who will save more American lives than anyone else are not doctors. They're the software engineers and data scientists that figure out an algorithm that can improve safety by 10% on the road. They will save more American lives than any doctor ever has in the U.S. And that just goes to show you just how dangerous the roads really are. And if you think about it, it makes sense. It's a 2,000 pound machine. If you hit someone at 20 miles an hour, you can easily kill them. And, and, and that's where I think there is, for sure, companies are taking safety seriously. And I want highly educated people involved in it. 
but there is a big difference between a team of engineers designing a product and a single doctor who, you know, with one bad decision could cut my artery off or something. Let's take things into the education space. You wanted to become a doctor. You said that in a previous interview. And why did that change? I think for me, I just like didn't have much of an interest in the um, field. I started to realize I, I just couldn't bring myself to care about it. Also, like, and this is a bit of a hot take. Almost everyone I talked to who wanted to become a doctor was like, oh, I want to save lives. And I like looked it up one day and I found that the average doctor saves like 10 lives over the course of their lifetime. Um, okay. You know, the decent numbers, you know, but it's, it's not, it, it, you're, you're talking a 50 year career, 10 lives saved, not at all disrespecting doctors. They're very, very important members of our society. But the profession is such that your impact is only that of every patient you see. And unless you're like a cardiothoracic surgeon constantly saving people from dying of heart attacks, there's only so many lives that can be saved in that process. And the only reason I bring it up is because if you are a young person and your goal is to save lives by going into medicine, if that truly is the goal, there are many other professions out there that save significantly more lives uh, and impact significantly more lives. Here's a funny thing. So in the US, there is a statistic that the US government has. There's a certain government agency that values the average American life at, I think, about $10 million. It's anywhere from like seven to $10 million. The and average, the reason is, you know, the average, average American over the lifespan or just? Uh, yes. So th they say that the average American is worth about seven to $10 million to the country. And the reason they have this statistic is when you are making broad based policies for the entire country, you have to have some kind of a number where you're like, okay, if it costs us $20 million per person, to improve you know, life expectancy by this much, we cannot use taxpayer money for that. This money has to be spent somewhat effectively, right? Um, and so, you know, I mean, kind of hot take, right? Like if, if the average life is worth about $7 million, if you're able to um, start like a financial boot camp that saves people uh, collectively $10 million, uh, you know, uh, year over year, but you're saving a life every single year. I, I think that there are so many ways that you can calculate impact, you know, kind of goes into like data science and data analytics. Like you can cut the data an infinite number of ways, but I think I realized that like be, being a doctor wasn't going to serve what I wanted to do. And software was a lot more, a much more direct way of impacting people's lives. They way to impact people's lives much more uh, broadly. And even more relevant in like recent times, for example, the, the prominence of technology influence during the COVID era was the visualization of data and the mm -hmm. metrics and everything. And it just made data analysis and data science just come to the front line. So- And um, cancer, computer vision and algorithms can now detect cancer more accurately than doctors can. Obviously, it's a bit different with the computer vision and AI in healthcare because you're dealing with human life. It's almost like the self-driving stuff. There's a lot of regulation and roadblocks and obstacles before mm -hmm. we can have AI telling you if you have cancer or not. But with data science and data analysis and data ana analytics, the impact is almost, it's here, it's now. And I saw this during COVID as in the metrics were very interesting. I downloaded Excel sheets from um, the government website here. I didn't have the skills to sort of like go for the data, but I was just thinking, wow, it would be cool if I could visualize this data and find out like COVID cases in my specific area. And data, data analytics, it's it had it had it's having this moment, and there might be hopefully not similar situations where data analysis because analysis sort of shine. We don't want another pandemic, um, but I I could feel like there are more situations in the future where we might see more useful data analysts. Here's a really interesting use of uh, data analysis. There's this uh, really cool think tank called the, the C4DS. It's the Center for Advanced Defense Studies. Mm -hmm. um, and they operate out of Washington, D.C. And they had this really interesting analysis. So the United States and a bunch of countries, we all sanctioned North Korea like years ago. But somehow, Kim Jong-un is still getting these pimped out like Mercedes-Benz, um, like, you know. Yeah, yeah. I've seen the pictures. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's crazy. I mean, these, these, they're like, they're like, you know, like nice, nice Mercedes Benz cars. And it's like, okay, wait, these were made in a factory. Like these cars obviously were made in a factory like a couple of months ago. Germany was the only country that these specific cars are made. Um, Germany embargoes, um, what do you call it? Uh, North Korea. And, and, and Germany actually stands by its embargo. It's not like one of those countries that says they embargo a country and then just like ship stuff under the radar. And so what the Center for Advanced Defense Studies did is that they uh, analyzed a bunch of satellite data and they were able to track from a German port all the way to Seoul, South Korea, where a, um, the shipping containers for specific containers that came from Germany went. And then they tracked that it went from Seoul, South Korea, and then was offloaded onto a Russian tanker, um, or uh, not a Russian tanker, a Russian uh, ship afterwards, 
which turned off its transponder, but they could see it because, I mean, you know, it's, it's the open ocean, you can't hide. So they could physically see it using satellite images and computer vision to be like, okay, that's the one that like this one and this one are the same thing. Um, and then track, okay, this is probably how Kim Jong-un got his uh, Mercedes. Now, why is this important? Why should it like, okay, cool. Now I know Kim Jong-un gets a Mercedes from Germany by, you know, basically transporting it to Russia. The reason that this is important is that regimes like Kim Jong-un's only survive, uh, well, for multiple reasons, but one of the biggest ones is that they have the backing of the elite in society, people who who themselves are able to control other people. So it's like the kind of this like web of corruption that goes downwards. Kim Jong-un can pay off, you know, maybe like 20 to 30 different people, but those people themselves, they have their own tiny little kingdoms and fiefdoms that they have to manage and they have to bribe people all the way down to the basic peasant level. And it's important to understand where these luxury goods are coming from because they're the thing that are basically propping up this entire system. Uh, a hot take, it's totally possible that uh, North Korea is being uh, propped by an Hermes bag somewhere that Kim Jong-un is able to gift to one of his top generals who's able to then give it to his wife or something, keep the whole family happy. That's a, that's natural use of how data, data and analytics is showing how luxury goods find their way to North Korea. That is very interesting. And that's a very interesting way of just showing the impact. It's a very interesting story of an anecdote of actually say. In um, software, software is eating the world. So I want to, I want to go back to your chemistry degree in any shape or form. Is it sort of helped you within your career? My, my quick answer is no. Um, okay. my long answer is I want to ask myself this question again in five years and see if I have a different answer, but yeah, like I'm what, four years removed from my degree now. Haven't used it a day in my life since then. Um, and I will say what it did give me or what I did get was, I, so I went to Emory, right? Which was, a, a it's a top 20 um, institution when I got admitted, I dropped like 22 uh, after I graduated, but uh, I, I don't know if I had anything to do with that. The point I'm making is that it's a university where a lot of like smart people like did go. And so the crowd that I got to hang out with, the standards to which I apply to my work and everything, some of that is very much influenced by Emory. But if the value of the education was, I was just with a bunch of other smart people, um, you know, I can't really put that on the degree. Is in the, the value of a degree was essentially the network that you gained through your, through the time you spent there. Yeah. And there are, are so many problems with that. Uh, you know, yeah, there are so many problems with that, but yeah, long story short, I'd say I have not used my degree a single day of my professional life. Okay. But well, that could still possibly change maybe my opinion of it might change but yeah I, I would be surprised if the chemistry degree like the, the longer i get removed from it the less relevant it becomes i believe you know and almost anyone that used their degree as far as i know used it to get their first job and then after that it's all like no i just like you know picked up frameworks and stuff myself afterwards unless they had like specific master's degrees or specific phds um it's the bachelor's i'm talking about yeah i want to jump into social media platforms when did you start getting into youtube and why did you start a youtube channel the reason I started is because my mom had unfortunately lost her job when the pandemic started. And uh, she lost her job because the company she worked for basically became invalidated by the pandemic. I actually, I, I'm going to go check their stock um, after this is all over. I don't know how the company survives the pandemic because it was a company that did uh, conventions. So when you go to a convention, there's a company that handles all of the printing and the organization and all the stuff in the background, um, you know, a large company too, um, like all the basic logistics of it and everything. That company doesn't have a reason to exist. For the last two years, basically, which is, I mean, and it, it, you know, it sucks for them. Is it no, not at all their fault. And then there was no one we could be mad at either. Like I understand the company's position. Like you can't conduct business. Of course you can't keep, keep people on uh, your payroll. So anyways, that happened. And then I was like, okay, well, I had these skills. Uh, I would tableau at the time and I was able to get a job. My first data analytics job paid about 55 K a year in Dallas, Texas which is not amazing, but very, very livable. $55,000 Dallas, Texas at my age, you could very comfortably live on that salary. And so I was like, okay, well, I have this skill. This is really all I needed to get my job. Let me see if I can teach to people. So I put out that course, super cool. I didn't do well at all. No one watched it. Uh, and I'm like, okay, I, mean, I, I did my part. I did what I was going to do. Beyond that, I'm not really sure what I can do. About a year passes and I watched this video by Ali Abdal, this really big YouTuber. So he started off as a doctor in Cambridge. And he's one of those people that kind of realized, oh, I can make a much bigger impact by, you know, not being a doctor, by going and becoming a YouTuber. He actually quit his like medical profession recently. And he had this video that just happened to come out that day. Uh, this is February of 2021. 
And it, he said, if you want to become a YouTuber, just do it. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. Long story short, he basically said, if you want to make a video, just make it. Don't worry about anything. He said, if anything, get a nice, like a decent mic, but outside of that, don't worry about anything. And so the next day I like was like, okay, one thing I've noticed is that people make these day to life videos. Okay. And I noticed everyone wants to be a vlogger. A bit of a tangent, but there's this funny uh, show going on in Seattle right now where basically a bunch of tech people roast each other. And almost all of them are like, yeah, we all hate our jobs. We just want to be creatives. Like the ones over there, obviously it, it attracts a certain crowd, but it's really funny because I noticed that a lot of the day in the life videos, they were basically all like vlogs, right? So they would say like, I got up in the morning, I got coffee. I did this activity, I did that activity. Google pays me a billion squillion dollars a year. And I also get a nice office and, oh, I don't have to pay for my meals either because Google pays for that stuff for me. Um, not throwing any shade at the people at Google, uh, just saying that was a cool video in 2017. Uh, Mayuko, uh, Joe Matek, like these really big, like people that started off that trend, they were doing that back in 2017. And back then it was like, oh, it was super cool. I'm like, oh, this sounds, sounds like a great company to work for today. It's kind of like, okay, well, I mean, you know, why do I care anymore? And so I was like, okay, well, let me make something a little bit different. Let me show people what I actually do in a day. So I do some client work on the side. I took some client data, completely anonymized it, literally impossible to tell what it said, uh, prior. And I did this exercise in Python where I'm like, okay, here's some data transformations. I do this, I do that, put it all together. Um, and that video ended up getting 1.5 million views. Uh, I mean, over the course of a year, I started to realize that it was going to be big in about um, two months later when it hit 3000 views. So it went from five years to 3000 views. I was like, oh damn, like I'm a YouTuber now. Uh, <laughs> <You made it. laughs> yeah, I made it. Exactly. I was, I was like, I made it. And then eventually I was able to monetize purely based off that one video. And okay, like now I have an audience just given that this video exists. Let me pump out courses. So I pumped out my Python course. I put out my SQL course. I recently put out an Excel course. The idea is to give people all the resources they need in order to become a data analyst and give people as much of the privilege that I've had in the form of a video. There's some stuff that I can't give people. Like um, I come from an upper middle income family. My parents instilled certain values in me of like um, certain expectations, probably the better way to put it. They kind of expect me to make a certain, like a certain salary. Okay. And I, I think that's, it's important to recognize that's a privilege that leads me to make the salary that I do, just because I believe that a certain, like you, you need to be making a certain salary to have a decent life, but depending on what, you know, socioeconomic status you grew up in, that number will be different. Right. Um, and, but of the stuff that I can instill in people, I try and instill that in them. And even the salary thing, I do try and instill it in people. There are people that come up to me and say they're being paid 40 K in New York city. And I tell them that's garbage. It's not your fault. You need to find a better job but that is garbage. No one should be paying a data analyst that little money in New York City. And that's not even a hot take. That's just a fact. $40,000 in New York City. How are you supposed to live on that? You know? Is it, um, that sounds pretty small, actually. Very, very minimal. But I, I'm, I think we're going to get into negotiation later. Hmm. It's a negotiating salaries. It's, it's an art. It's a skill. We need to talk yeah. about it. But uh, again, I've never really stepped into America, but I know you've come over to London. What do you think of London? Love London. Beautiful city. I, I, so my cousins live in uh, Bristol, right? And then now one of them lives in London. Like London is so clean. It's just like, wait, what? Like what, 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 it is clean, you know? And I'm like, um, it's so clear. Have you gone to New York City? I love New York City, but have you gone there? It is filthy. It smells like piss or weed at every block in what? New York City. Yeah, New York, yeah exactly. Bad. It called. My, my brother went there. So I went there seven years ago. So maybe they cleaned it up since then. My brother went there three months ago. And he's like, yeah, yeah. Every block is like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> again, I, 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 yeah, I'm not taking the piss on you. Or wait, taking the piss means kidding around, right? Yeah, yeah taking the piss. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm taking the piss on New York City here. Um, it's a wonderful city, and I'd love to live there one day. I went to London, and of the three, what I call super major cities, I've gone to, so New York, Tokyo, and London, uh, they each have something very special to offer. And I'd say London is the most multicultural city I've ever been in, ever, like bar none, in the sense that I have never walked just randomly and heard so many languages that I have literally zero familiarity with. If someone speaks Russian, for example, I don't know any Russian, but I can pick up on Eastern European languages. I can be like, okay, that sounds like Russian to me. Or like, I can tell the difference between Korean, Japanese, and Chinese. But walking through London, I could not understand when you, like, or I could not even understand what language people were speaking. And I saw people from parts of the world, like, I have no idea what part of the world you're from. It's a wonderfully diverse city, too financialized in my opinion. Um, and there's a whole thing on how the UK government kind of just gave away too much power to the city of London. So you have London, you have the city of London. And they really went way too hard with the whole financial capital of the world thing to where it is difficult to afford getting an apartment in or a flat in 
the city if you're not in like finance, basically. Yeah. But that's all separate thing. Finance are these days software. But, but even then, like you go to the UK and you look at software salaries and it's like, wait, like you guys are not being paid as much as you should be paid, you know? Yeah. Um, that is, because I keep looking at the American salary and it's yeah. ridiculous. I'm just like, yeah. wait, what? We do the same stuff. Just talking to a German YouTuber who lives in London, exact same thing. He's like, I worked at Facebook. I do the exact same work as some coworkers in the US. And literally everyone outside the US is mad at them because, you know, exact same work. It's, um, and the cost of living in London is ridiculous as well. You're yeah. right. Rent yeah. is crazy. Then to buy a house, is just, it's almost impossible. You go like, go outside of London which I did, but yeah. Right, yeah, no, no. Well, and, and, and to me, that's crazy that, okay, that, that, you know, someone as educated as you has to go outside of London to get a house, you know, like shows that I, I don't think the salaries over there are distributed the way they should be. Firstly, if, if you spend enough time saving up and being smart with your money, you probably could afford um, a house in London in, let's say, I don't know, by the time you're age 35 or something, you start working by your like 23, save up business savvy finance, and you save up, invest in stocks, buy Bitcoin, you probably could afford a house in London. And they, they do have some schemes like shared ownership in where you right. own a percentage of the property and the government or some other party owns another percentage. Real estate is a massive thing in London. And uh, if you get into it, it, it will benefit you in the long term, I guess. Don't quote me on that, just in case <laughs> buy a house in London. Um, so there's a lot of people that travel from their home countries into other, other countries, like major cities, to either study or to work. So the, the quick question I want to ask is, what are the top considerations that you see people making for specifically data analyst role that sort of like coming to the, into America? So sponsorship is obviously a big thing, right? So like if you're coming in, uh, you're almost stuck with like large companies because those are the ones that are going to be willing to sponsor. Um, sponsor being the term for sponsor your visa, basically. That's going to be foremost in anyone who comes to the U.S. is mine. But I guess I don't have to really say that to anyone. I think some of it's a mindset thing. I would say, think about it this way. Why do software engineers get paid insane salaries in the United States? It's because at the end of the day, this country produces more technology or more software products than any other country in the world. We probably produce more software products than like most countries combined, save maybe China. And the immigration system is relatively restrictive. And the college system is very closed off to most Americans. The, the reason I bring all that up, right, is that if you're migrating to the United States, I would say, remember the fact that salaries are as high as they are because the demand is so high in this country for those roles and the supply is so low and the American education system is not capable of producing enough graduates to fill in that supply. That's why the salaries are still as high as they are. Any logical company wants to reduce the, the salaries of its software engineers because they're so inflated over here, but they can't because the market's very competitive because supply is very low, demand is very high. So um, go in with that confidence, I would say, if you're uh, an immigrant to this country and you're you know, working in this field, it applies to data analysts too, like these technical professions. There are not enough Americans that have these skills and there are many jobs and a lot of income you can derive from this country. If you have the confidence to be like, yeah, no, like I'm here because this country is not producing enough of uh, the talent that they need and the opportunity is here. So I have to keep that in mind. Okay. Let's talk about since we're talking about finance and financial um, topics, let's talk about negotiation. Have you ever had to negotiate a salary? And if you have, how did you do it? So I've never had to. I've always been offered decent salary, or I've always been offered good salaries, but I always do. At least in the, in the United States, any decent company will lowball you because they expect you to come back with a higher offer. Or lo lo when I say lowball, as in they, they won't give you the most that they can give you. I have only had one job where I didn't negotiate. And that was because it was my first job. And I, I was just like, I was just happy to have the job. But even in that job, I should have negotiated the salary. So for my first job or my first jump from a company, I negotiated a salary and they ended up offering me an extra 10K in salary. So that worked out pretty well. And then at Nordstrom, I negotiated and they ended up offering me an extra, I think, 10K in a starting bonus instead of giving it to me in salary which isn't that big of a deal at my age because very few people stay at companies for longer than two years anyways. It doesn't matter too much for me. I would say that always negotiate, always ask for more. What I, I, I guess the, the kind of the mechanics of it, I get offered a salary over uh, email or uh, over phone. And I'm like, thank you so much for the offer. Let me think about it overnight and I'll get back to you tomorrow morning. And then I'll go ahead and do my research after that. I'll go, see, is this fair? Is this not? 
even if it's fair, I always ask for more. And I'd say ask for 10% more. That's conservative. If you think the salary is good. A lot of companies have salary bands. They can go up and down in that band. So I would say that's probably the most effective or that's the technique that's worked for me. Say, thank you for the offer. Let me get back to you. The most effective technique is to get two tech companies to fight over you. Be interviewing with the Google and Facebook at the same time. Oh, and I forgot to mention that. So I was interviewing with another company when I was interviewing with Nordstrom and that other company was willing to offer me a lot more because I showed them my Nordstrom offer. They couldn't match the Nordstrom offer, but they were also based out of Phoenix. Mm -hmm. It didn't really matter because like, hey, I am okay not being paid as much in Phoenix as I am in Seattle because the living costs are just way, way lower, like not even comparable. That's the most effective technique you can use. Pit two companies against each other and see how much they want to you. Because at the end of the day, think about it this way. You have a lot more power than you think you do. One, because the labor market is so tight right now, especially in this field. Like the, the labor market in this field was tight before COVID. Now it's super tight. And on top of that, it the statistic is that it costs, I think, one and a half times or like 75% of someone's salary to hire them with all the man hours that have to be put into actually getting the recruiters to find the people, all the interviews that have to be done, lost productivity because the entire team has to interview this person. They have to discuss this person. They have to make sure they hire the right person. My brother was asking me, for example, like why interviews can be so hard. And I told him it's because the damage caused by hiring one bad employee is significantly more than any good employee can give you. Because the funny part is the best employees go around trying to help the bad employees, like the ones that are just straight up ineffective. And so the reason I bring that up is that if you get all the way to that level of negotiations, companies, which are very conservative entities in this sense, in the hiring sense, want you. So you should definitely ask for more. You have a lot of power. One thing I want to ask is, have you ever been rejected from a role when you've applied? Have you ever had to deal with rejection? And if you have, how, how did you deal with it? Yeah. So when I applied for the Nordstrom position, I applied to like 80 something companies, Nordstrom and one other company were the only ones that got back to me. Yeah. It was ridiculous. And it, oh, this is like 80. Yeah. 80, it was like 87, something like that. Um, I think I had just North of two years of experience and I was looking for a senior position, which is a bit of a difficult ask, honestly. And I can kind of understand why I was lucky enough to where the salary I was getting paid up in my, um, the company I was at the time was difficult to be two other companies got back to me, but they only offered me jobs with salaries that were lower than what I was getting paid at the company I was working at. So I, I think part of the position was, or part of the problem was I was gunning higher than people my age typically gun for position wise with my level of experience dealing with rejection. I think that you can throw yourself a pity party and that's totally fine for a short amount of time. I, I think it, 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 it is partially an effective way to deal with emotions. Like just feel bad for yourself, you know, go eat an ice cream, you know, get drunk, go to bed, wake up the next morning. But then, but then like resign yourself doing that for one day and then get up the next morning with the determination to fix your problems. Because I don't want to be one of those people that says like, oh no, don't feel bad. No, I mean, look, stuff happens. You got to feel bad for yourself. Yeah. It's a natural human emotion. What happens is what do you do after that? What's the action you take after that, after the emotions uh, over? It's, it's one of the reasons I started focusing on my YouTube channel as well. It's because I want to build up this product pro project portfolio that's very unique of other people's. And with the number of subscribers I have, there are only so many people in the country that um, have certain data analyst experiences that I have, and it makes me a much more competitive applicant now. So I, I, I think that we are on route to solving that issue. I would also say another thing to deal with in relation to rejection is a lot of times you get rejected for arbitrary reasons. One of the biggest ones is you just don't have enough experience. The, the big milestones in like corporate America are your first job, three years of experience, five years of experience, seven years of experience, 10 years of experience. And then after 10, it doesn't matter. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't believe it matters that much after 10. And so recently I hit that three year of experience milestone and I've noticed companies reach out to me a lot more now. So the, it, it's a very like bureaucratic process. So don't worry too much if you're getting rejected, maybe the bureaucracy is rejecting you. Are you getting this offers because you've got a three year experience or because you are very visible on social media platform as a data analyst? Is it, doesn't YouTube play a massive part into that as opposed to the experience? I would hope it does, but no recruiters ever mentioned it to me. Um, I don't think it does because my audience is entirely other data analysts. And my audience is typically people less experienced than me. And the reason that's important, right? It's like, you know, if a senior data analyst or if a uh, principal data, data um, scientist is like looking at my channel, then they may reach out to me and be like, hey, I have a job offer and I actually have the authority to push your application through. But because my channel is a teaching channel, it tends to attract people less experienced than me. So I'm not sure it's, uh, I, I'm getting any offers from it because an HR recruiter is like not, like it doesn't show up on their YouTube feed. Like the algorithm doesn't serve that up to them.
Now, that being said, in the recruitment process, it might be helpful. I haven't gone through the recruitment process since I've got like been in Nordstrom, so I wouldn't be too sure. But the real question is, how would you then advise people that want to become data analysts to put their skill sets out there? Because look, there is, there's a lot of demand, true, but there's also a lot of competition. How would you basically advise an entry level or maybe a mid-level person to be able to put themselves out there, put their skill set out there? I think GitHub is a good way to do it. LinkedIn's your best friend. LinkedIn's what, what's going to get you. Like at the end of the day, HR recruiters are the ones that are like, they're on LinkedIn all the time. So I would say polish your LinkedIn like it's your most prized possession because it should be at the end of the day, like LinkedIn is that social network that everyone, it, it, it's it, like Microsoft's really like aimed it to be that like hiring social network. And, and I think they're doing a good job in reference to that. So I would say have the GitHub, but make sure your LinkedIn is very polished and make sure it's such that like your title screams, hire me. And you're like within five seconds, they can get to your like portfolio and understand that you are an elite candidate. Okay. Okay. As in, I'm, I'm going to start rounding up with the final closing questions. It probably get a bit personal, but you do a lot. Right, you're a data analyst, you spend time on YouTube. How do you manage your time? How do you go around time management? I currently don't have a social life. At, at this exact moment in time in my life, that is, that's how I manage it. Um, it is something I am actively trying to change. The Seattle winters did help with that as well. Okay, wow. All right, um, so do you ever feel overwhelmed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not having a social life can be very overwhelming. I think the important thing is having a strong support network around you. There's a difference between not having a social life and not having friends. They're not the same thing. So I'm lucky that I have like a lot of friends and a family and a very supportive girlfriend that can like help me process being overwhelmed with stuff. And I think that's just a basic trick to success in life. This whole idea that you can kind of like lone wolf your way to success, I think is... It work, I'm sure it works for some people, but I think it's fundamentally flawed. You do need to forge your own path and everything, but you need to have people behind you that can like critique your decision-making, that can comment on like, are you doing what you truly want to do? Like I got a job offer um, a little while back for a job that paid very, very well, but it was very different from what I wanted to do. And, you know, my support network was like, okay, sure, you'll make money, but like, are you doing what you want to do? And the more important question is, are you hurting for money today? If you're hurting for money today, you know, again, at that point in your life, greed is good. Go get that bag. But after you have like stabilized yourself financially, you know, you should try and see what you really want to do. So I think that support network is really the best way to keep yourself from uh, the negative consequences of being overwhelmed. At the end of the day, being overwhelmed, I also think is, it's just part of being like, it, it's part of being a productive adult. If you're a particularly productive adult, you will be overwhelmed at certain points in your life. And I think that's okay. There, there's really cool YouTube video I recommend everyone, everyone watches. It's like how to lead a good life at Harvard. So type that into Google, it should be up there. And it's this dude that like, you know, lived like he's like in his seventies now, right? But, uh, you know, he goes over his lifestyle and he's like, I'm like, oh yeah, this guy seems like fairly well accomplished. I'm curious to see what he says. And, and one of the things he says is he says, like, everyone talks about balancing your life out. He says, I think balance makes no sense. How do you balance out 10 different things at the same time? He's like, I think life's more like juggling. You have a bunch of balls. And you add and, and you, you move forward and improve in life when you add energy to things. So, you know, in your job, you do a sprint, you work a lot harder, you add energy to it, but then you kind of like let it coast a little bit and then focus on some other stuff. And he says like juggling is what a lot of successful people do instead of balancing. Uh, balancing is trying to get a steady state with everything. And he means like steady state also means you're not improving. Um, whereas with uh, juggling, you add energy to things. And what's the most important ball when you're juggling? It's the one that's falling. So you, you add things, add energy to things that continuously make sure that like you're uh, adding energy to things, but you prioritize it as it, as it comes, right? But he made a very important point as well. He says, when you're juggling, there are rubber balls and there are glass balls. Rubber balls are things like your career. If you get fired from a company for, um, you know, anything short of maybe killing a coworker or something, uh, or like extreme gross negligence, you know? Um, oh, the reason I brought that up, right, is because at certain factories, uh, unions have actually been able to, and I'm not anti-union by the way, it's, I just find this really funny, but unions have negotiated certain terms to where you can uh, run someone through with a forklift twice before a company's allowed to fire you. People don't have to like know about you getting fired or anything. You can even, I mean, potentially even still say you work at that company who checks, you know? Um, that's not me advocating that. I'm just saying who checks. Um, so that's a rubber ball, right? You drop it, you can pick it back up. There are glass balls, like your relationship with your spouse. 
and your family. If you drop the ball on that, there is irreparable damage that can be done to your life. And it is important that you understand the difference in um, what is important at what time, which is the idea of the falling ball, and what is so important that the risk of dropping it is too high to let it drop. It's a great video. Highly recommend people watch it. And I think that is uh, how you manage. I, I think particularly productive people will be overwhelmed. There's no such thing as balance. Um, and I think balance is overrated. It's, it's, it's all about juggling. Yeah. I, you know what? That's a very different perspective that I've never heard before. I guess I'll, I'll go watch that video just to see, just to imagine the whole, how you're sort of managing your time and things in your life as juggling. But what takes more energy? This is just an interesting question. What takes more energy, balancing or juggling? Which like, what takes more energy? Which one can you do for longer? Juggling, for sure. I think juggling takes a lot more energy. Uh, again, here is an example of someone who lives a very balanced lifestyle. Um, go to work, get up in the morning, mm -hmm. have their coffee, go to work, work eight hours, you know, leave at five, no matter what, and then go back home. And maybe they hang out with some friends, grab a beer, go to happy hour, come back home, hang out with the family, get dinner, go to bed. That's a balanced lifestyle right there. You have your good social life. You have your job. You're doing a good job at that. You're getting good sleep. Um, nothing wrong with that at all. Without extra hours being put in somewhere, all of those things will continue in a steady state. Your relationship with your friends will stay the same way. Your job, you, you know, maybe you'll get promoted here and there. But if you're only putting, if you're putting in like literally only eight hours, that's it. You'll get promotions at a regular on a regular cadence. Uh, maybe you're lucky you work in an industry where that's okay. Um, and yeah, I mean, life just continues on, I think, you know, I, I, to me, that's what balance is. Juggling is, okay, this week I have to focus on like getting some YouTube videos out. Obviously, you know, my job, I got to do it every single day, but this week I focus on YouTube videos because sponsors are coming up next week. I'll do some of my consulting because sponsors are not coming up. And I think if you have a particularly productive lifestyle and you're moving yourself, uh, un unless your dream is to work, like live that balanced lifestyle, which many people's dreams are that, and that's wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, I, 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 it's a big privilege for me to not want that because that's so normal to me. So I, I think that's important to recognize as well. But I would say you're not moving the ball forward if, if there's not some stress in your life, in my opinion. You know? uh, I don't think I've ever met a really successful person who has no stress in their life, except for people that are insanely smart. I've met a couple of people that are insanely smart. And for them, it's not stressful because it's so easy. For the rest of us, it's like, well, if there's no stress, you're not moving forward, in my opinion. You were saying that um, having that balanced lifestyle could, it scares you, right? You're, you have the option to choose the other one, which is the juggling lifestyle. I, I think what scared me about corporate America was the fact that I saw people, when I was an intern, mm -hmm. um, I saw people working in a company for 25 years. And I was like, what? That's balanced lifestyle. I'm not even 25 years old. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and, and to be honest, like, and, and they have like 18 years, 15 years, and you have these awards that are given <laughs> for... Yep, yep, yep. Gold like, watches. <laughs> like Amazon gift cards. Yeah. At the time, it looked very good and everyone's clapping. Obviously, you've, you've served a very long time and these people are happy. I don't know. They look happy anyway. But it scared me because I was like, I can't sit down in the same desk for two, two days, let alone 25 years. Yeah. And I thought, yeah. okay, can't do the corporate stuff. I need to go to a startup where your next day is unpredictable. You don't know when you're going to lose your job. I've worked in a startup where um, uh, the night before we're all having drinks and I come in into, into the job and everyone's been fired because they're trying to save money and we're right. just going to keep with it. And I was like, wow, that, that's how unpredictable startups can be. Right, 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 right. But there's always a growth. But yeah, the, the, the com being comfortable kind of scares me. And I have my own sort of method of like, juggling which is i make everything link to each other so just making sure it all links and i guess it's some sort of juggling in a sense but this conversation has been very excellent well and also i would say one thing right like you know you brought up the good thing about corporate america and um exactly what you said is what scared me about my first company uh, my first company was again i loved it. it it was a great place but it was very much a company a lot of people went to uh in order to kind of steady state for the rest of their lives uh and yeah i, I would meet people so I got my first promotion about eight months into the job over there. They were very happy with my performance. I got a promotion and that promotion made me, we were fairly, me and my manager were fairly confident. I was making more money than most, like a decent number of the people on the floor at the time. And these people had been working for 20 something years. Um, again, money's not everything, but money makes life a lot easier. You know, just, uh, you know, like, like 
And I'm even talking about just like, you know, some moderate increases in income and stuff like that. And that scared me when I saw, I'm like, oh, this is what could happen to me if I don't try and improve all the time. If I don't try and learn new skills, upscale. And the exact uh, opposite of that is if you've ever met a director under the age of 40, um, a lot of the times those people are examples of people who were like in corporate America, but like really succeeded, like really, you know, worked hard, juggled and made it big because it's so funny. So many of them are the types of people who basically only had kids after they became a director. Like it's super obvious because like they became a director and you see their kids like three years old. I, I, I think that in corporate America, there is a analog to what you're saying. Uh, and, and that, that would kind of be it. the, the, the 30, the, the 30 something year old director. Yeah. As in, I, as um, for my internship, I worked for an uh, American uh, company. And one thing I noticed was getting a promotion or being recognized was not necessarily based on the work you do, mm -hmm. but more into your network and how much people you can please. And that really put me off. Cause that's fair. Yeah. I'm a software guy. I code. I want my promotion to be based on the work I do, not who I know within a company or how much I can shout about things. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that sort of put me off. And some people might like that. Some people are very good at networking people, people, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, that, that put me off personally. It did in a startup. You don't have time to network. You just go get this. Right. And I, and I wouldn't disagree with your, your characterization. I think your characterization is fairly accurate too. Um, it, you know, it, uh, so much of it is about like, you know, who, you know, um, mm -hmm. and you know, for some people, they like that. Some people, they don't like that. That's yeah. totally fair. Yeah. But, um, let, let, to not sort of like, um, do away with networking, networking does help in a lot of, as in, I met you through networking essentially. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'm just going to ask one final question. Right. Mm -hmm. So I want to basically stand on your shoulders, not literally, but, um, mm -hmm. figuratively. So, I want to stand on, on your experiences that you've accumulated over the years in order to sort of put myself in a better space in, 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 in a quicker time, in a quicker amount of time. What tips and advice can you give me right now that can allow me to do that? How can I stand on your shoulders? Consume as much knowledge as you possibly can. And so two things, consume as much knowledge as you possibly can and deeply think about what do you want out of life and mm -hmm. how is this knowledge going to help me get there? I think that's the trick to happiness for the most part. And the second thing is I think a lot of successful people literally just do 10% more work every day than other people do. They, they literally just do a little bit more work every single day. They're, they're willing to skip out on that one happy hour here and there. They're willing to spend that one weekend, stuff like that. That is probably one of the more simple secrets of success. Um, and I guess a third tip along with that is one of the best piece of advice I ever got from like a coworker. Um, so he was this Deloitte guy that came to our company to work there. Very young guy, but he was like a director at the company. He was crazy. Um, and I asked him, I'm like, yo, how do you like, you know, get like, how do I get like paid more and stuff like that? He said, okay, look, there's only one way to guarantee that you'll be paid a lot more money. And he said, you need to offer so much financial value to a company that they literally cannot not pay you more. Um, mm. And so he said like, he's in my target's always 10 X. I try, I, I look at my salary and what I want to get to. And I'm like, how can I, if I want to make 200 K, how do I give, uh, give the company $2 million in benefit? And how do I quantify that? And he said, cause you come out of that with, you know, the, it, it's, it's a multifaceted approach. Everything's like linked, right? Cause by doing that, you become a significantly more skilled employee and people like poo poo on being a good employee, but there's so much stuff you learn by being a good employee. You learn like certain skills and stuff like that, right? So uh, you learn how, how to be a significantly better boy. You are drastically increasing your chances of getting a promotion and drastically increasing your chances of getting a uh, raise. And if you don't, then you are now so skilled that you can uh, confidently go into another company and interview there and get a job over there. And that's exactly what he did. You know, as soon as the company couldn't pay him enough money, he just left. Um, and he, he, he's like a senior director now at, at like some other company. So I, I think... That's what I realized is the trick to making money it, it provide people with so much value that they have no, nothing else to do, but recognize and, you know, pay for it. Yeah. I like the, I like the approach of actually putting a number on it. So whatever salary you're making or whatever salary you want to get to, so sort of create that value for your company. Um, I've never looked at it like that. Um, I, I usually go for, for the approach of make the company need you is in 
they 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 need you you can't leave and it's it's one of the ways i sort of um maintained a job right right now. right wow. so cobalt developers had to keep jobs today yeah <laughs> you make them need you know? you. yeah just put like a little also, maintain those ibm mainframes you know <laughs> But yeah, that's a very good, I've, you know what? I'm going to use that. Um, next year, I'll probably be like a director or something, earning like go. 500K, hopefully in America is in, to get a higher salary. <laughs> yeah. But um, thank you for your time, Shishai. Um, This has been a lovely conversation and I've gotten some stuff that I could use in my career and I hope our listeners have as well. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you for having me on so much, Richmond.